Hi everybody, I am so glad that you are here with us today. My name is Erica, I am our Graham Campus Student Ministry Pastor. I am one of our teaching pastors here on staff as well. Now, I am also a millennial. Do with that information what you will, roll your eyes, cheer, whatever that needs to look like for you. I turned 30 last year. That means that I can fall into the trap of nostalgia more, more than, better than, I don't know, anybody else, any other generation, nostalgia and millennials just kind of go hand in hand a little bit. And I try to fight it, like I try to block it out, but truly, honestly, like if you played the opening to a Disney movie from the 90s, I am right back there in it. Uh, if, if I walk into my parents' house and my mom is baking cookies, I need you to know, my parents have like renovated their entire house. But if I walk into their house and my mom is baking cookies, I am a little girl on that last day coming home from school after Christmas break. You know what I mean? You know that day, like the one of the best days of the year? Uh, if I am near a body of water and I smell gasoline, I am immediately like on the back of my dad's boat being pulled on an inner tube trying to look like super cool, even though I am absolutely not. Nostalgia is powerful. In fact, it is so powerful that the University of Southampton did a study on it. And this is how they talk about the effects of nostalgia. Nostalgia confers psychological benefits. When engaging in nostalgic reflection, people report a stronger sense of belongingness, affiliation, or sociality. They convey higher continuity between their past and their present. They describe their lives as more meaningful and they often indicate higher levels of self-esteem and positive mood. Although nostalgic engagement, especially when it is carried out habitually and excessively, may not be beneficial to all, it is a general resource on which people can capitalize to harness strength, a resource that allows them to cope more effectively with the vicissitudes of life. So there is absolutely good things to be found in nostalgia. It is powerful, it is helpful, it is a good resource. But nostalgia also makes us do like kind of dumb things, like go back and watch our childhood TV shows. Like, have you gone back and watched one of the shows that was a staple for you growing up? I, I have, I need you to know, there is no character development. When I was 10, I did not need character development. At 30, I absolutely need character development. How are they still making the same mistakes over and over season after season? And that is probably actually the only way that my taste in content has changed is that I need character development, but I still need it to exist in like a fun, bright, happy, colorful world. But I do need character development. And as one of your pastors, it is my desire, it is my prayer, it is my hope that you would grow and change for the better as well. I wanna be able to sit across from you or talk in a lobby or have a Zoom call with you and hear about how God has redeemed things and moments and parts of your life, how God has changed things, how you are living differently because of God's love, not to earn God's love. And that's what we're getting at today. Our current series, Jesus is Greater Than, is looking at the book of Hebrews and seeing all of the things that Jesus is actually greater than. And spoiler alert, it's a lot of things. Jesus is greater than a lot of things. And today we're looking at the fact that Jesus is greater than our origin stories, than, than your origin story. That's right. Jesus is actually greater and more powerful than the things that have shaped you. There's a moment in Hebrews where the unknown author is addressing this community, these group of churches that had a deep, rich, and beautiful Jewish heritage. And so the author is drawing examples from what they would have known. And he's, and he's writing it in a way that would have been different than writing to an audience that maybe didn't have a relationship with God before Jesus. And so that is the most important context that I can give you as we head to Hebrews chapter 3 together today. Um, if you have a physical Bible, feel free to flip there right now. But there is a great app called YouVersion that you can download and then you have the Bible with you at all times. It is on your phone. It is on your tablet. It is always accessible. You can have Bible reading plans. It will read the Bible aloud to you. It is a really, really great resource. And so we highly encourage you to download. The verses will also be up on the screen or you can just type it into the search bar and be like Hebrews chapter three and it'll pull it up for you. So we're gonna be starting right out. Hebrews chapter three, verse one, here we go. 
Therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, whom we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. Apostle and high priest are not words that you and I are using on a regular basis here anymore. And so for the ancient Israelites, again, this community that would have had a relationship with God prior to Jesus, the high priest served as the person who would go between God and people. The high priest performed sacrifices for the forgiveness of sins. The high priest would have been the person that they had gone to. Jesus is the ultimate high priest. Jesus came and acted as that go-between for all of us. His act on the cross allowed for forgiveness once and for all. And the word apostle means something being sent. It means that someone or something is being sent. And, and it originally did not have any connection to Jesus. It would have meant something like, a ship is being sent. Um, it would have meant that a messenger is being sent, but ultimately it became deeply connected to being sent by God or by Jesus to continue the work that was happening. Jesus has been sent from God for us. So this argument is already being made that Jesus is greater than these things that they already knew. Keep your eyes on Jesus who is greater. Verse two, he was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in all God's house. Jesus has been found worthy of greater honor than Moses, just as the builder of a house has greater honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house, bearing witness to what would be spoken by God in the future. But Christ is faithful as the son over God's house, and we are his house, if indeed we hold firmly to our confidence and the hope in which we glory. The author is addressing this entire group of people and saying, look, God is greater than us. Jesus is greater than Moses. You know Moses. You look up to Moses. Now think about just Jesus gets to be even greater than what you have already known. He's encouraging them to not look to their past for their only source of comfort or inspiration, but to look to Jesus. Jesus is greater than what your past can offer you. And I love this line, the hope in which we glory, that we get to live this life in a certain way with hope, with this belief, with this faith, and it is a glory and it is a goodness and it is something that gets to just fundamentally shape and change everything. Okay, we're gonna skip down a little ways now to verse 12, Hebrews chapter three, verse 12. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. That's, a, that's, that's kind of a heavy verse there. None of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart. I love the line, encourage one another as long as it is called today. But here's the deal. Sin's deceitfulness is that there is something better out there. Sin's deceitfulness is the belief that you can't bring your whole self to God. Sin's deceitfulness is that you don't need God. And that last deceitfulness is one that I really struggle with. It's one that I've wrestled with in my own life countless times, and I think I will continue to wrestle with. I started going to church when I was in middle school. And I was really pretty quickly sold on this whole God thing uh, because it was like the creator of the universe wants to be my friend. As a nerdy, lonely middle school girl, that was all I needed to hear. I was all in. And so I wasn't going to do the things that people had told me would make God sad. I wasn't going to make my friend sad. That wasn't what I wanted. And so I've just lived a good chunk of my life with that mindset, approaching everything that way. And so I have avoided loads of sins. 
But actually what it is, is I've avoided loads of the sins that we publicly in our humanness like rank and the ones that are more socially acceptable and the ones that are less socially acceptable. But I've lived my life with this mindset of, I'm not the worst, so I'm okay. Jesus will still be my friend. That is my origin story. My origin story is that I haven't had a big, epic mess up that God has had to save me from. I've just had a friend and thought, I don't need saving. That's silly. I'm fine. And I just think that God has been watching me walk around for so much of my life and thinking like, how adorable. L-O-L. You don't even know. Because while I have not needed saving from a giant moral failing, what I have needed saving from is my pride. And I have needed saving from my pride time and time and time again. Pride starts for me in these almost imperceivable ways. It starts so small. From the outside, it looks like I'm being responsible. It looks like I'm killing the game. It looks like I'm absolutely crushing it. I'm taking on more responsibilities because she's such a good leader and she's such a good servant. Oh my gosh. Like that's what it looks like from the outside. And then what's happening on the inside is I'm like, I've, got this. People trust me. God has given me responsibility. I'm doing great. I do not need to have my Jesus time, which is what I call quiet time because quiet time sounds boring. And so this is my time to like intentionally connect with Jesus, you know? And then I'm not letting people in. I'm not letting people help me. I am withdrawing. And then I am crash landing in a pile of shame of like, why couldn't I just do everything? Why couldn't I have just been perfect? Why couldn't I get it right? I say to people, and now I'm saying to all of you, and so this is maybe more public than I ever thought I would ever make this statement. I have for so long dreamt and prayed and wished that I could be beyond needing help, that I could be beyond being human, and I could be beyond needing God's help. I wish that I could live this life perfectly, all on my own, to not have to worry, to not have to stress, but that is not the life that any of us are invited to. All of us are invited to solely depend on Jesus, regardless of what our pasts have looked like. All of us have a series of mistakes so that we can look back on our life and see as little markers all along the road. The only difference between those mistakes is, is their socially acceptableness. The only difference is how we talk about them publicly or with others. Sin is able to deceive each of us, making us think that we are too good for God or too bad for God because of our past. Sin does not have the final say. And here is the deal. I am not the only one saying these things. The book of Hebrews continues to say this. In Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, this is what is being said. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us approach God's throne with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Jesus has acted as this high priest. He has come to earth. He has lived a perfect life. He has died on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. And he keeps walking with us through everything. He understands that there is struggle. He is not expecting perfection from any of us. He is inviting us to live closely with him. And that is the faith that we profess at a baptism that we are saying we are going to follow him all the days of our lives. We are not saying we will follow him perfectly all the days of our lives. We are not saying I follow Jesus so now I'll never make a mistake again. We are celebrating the goodness of Jesus. We aren't professing our own perfection. We are not professing good vibes only. We are not professing that we will have no more problems. We get to serve and worship and know and be known by the creator of the universe who loves you 
who wants to be in relationship with you, who wants to be close to you, who would send his son to be close. And for many of us, just like the churches that are being addressed in Hebrews, our origin stories are getting in the way of us truly experiencing the love and forgiveness of God. We are saying that who we are is greater than what Jesus can do. It is greater than Jesus. Now, many of us wouldn't outright say like, well, my past is more powerful than Jesus. But many of us have said, well, I could never do that because of my past. I can't tell you how many times I hear people say, oh, I could never walk into a church. I'd be struck by lightning. You're saying that your past is greater than Jesus. And so if church and the idea of following Jesus is new to you, the question for you to begin to think about is, what is the thing that stops you from believing God loves you? And if you've been following Jesus for a long time, or a short amount of time, what is the thing that keeps tricking you up? What is the thing that keeps causing you to fall, to stumble, to struggle? Today is the day to give that up. For most of us, there is something that is standing in our way. Now, I truly believe that over years, we can keep giving our life and our struggles to Jesus. And I believe that there are people in the world who truly get to live this life where it's like, I just solely rely on Jesus. But a bunch of us keep putting things in the hands of Jesus and then taking it back. <laughs> but here's the bottom line. Jesus can free you from the lies that you've been believing. But it doesn't mean that finding freedom in that is going to be easy. When the Anderson family, my family, goes on vacation, there are two things that always get turned on on the TVs and wherever we are. It is HGTV and it is Nick at Night. My sisters and I say all the time, are you even on vacation if you are not laying in bed watching reruns of Friends? Like that, like that is how often we just turn Nick at Night on in a hotel. But we also turn on HGTV and that plays all day long out, out in like the common kind of areas or spaces because there is nothing that the six of us can get on board with really in terms of TV that is like compelling except for HGTV. And now I get it. It's reality TV. It is fake. It is staged. I hear all of those words. But what we all know is like, they're not going to laugh at all the same things I'm going to laugh at. And I am not going to enjoy the medical dramas or the crime dramas that they are watching. And so HGTV gives us just enough of a storyline to be engaged around a content thing that like we can get on board with. We watch so much home renovation on, on vacation. And as we watch these shows, these designers, these creators, they like, they have a vision and they commit to this vision regardless of what is going on. And when they discover that there is a leak in the water heater, that there's a structurally unsound roof, that the foundation has been destroyed by termites, they're like, we got to keep going because that focal wall fireplace is going to be stunning. So let's just keep going. Their love for the fireplace carries them through. Faith, which is much better than a fireplace, is something that we get to hold on to when it seems like everything is falling apart. When whatever the things, the lies that we have clung to from our past, when those begin to fall apart because like we're trusting God more than them, when those things are no longer there to support us, it means that things are gonna get difficult for a while. It means it's gonna be a little bit tricky, but then what we will have on the other side is a story and a faith that is better and stronger and more beautiful than it is right now. And that is something that we cannot wait to show off and tell others about and tell others about the goodness of God. But that means that we have to actually address our origin stories. It means we actually have to look for the leaks. We have to look for the structurally unsound things. We have to look for the foundation that is giving away because our origin stories get in the way of the growth of our faith. Jesus can free you from the lies that you've been believing. But here's where it's going to get a little bit messier. Here is maybe where I'm going to hurt your feelings a little bit. And so I do apologize in advance. But you can't actually know how much greater Jesus is than your origin story if you don't know what your origin story is. And so... 
we are going to very delicately and very gingerly look back on your origin story together. So I want you to close your eyes. I want you to relax. I want you to not stress about all of the other things that are going on. I want you to just be present in this moment. Take a couple deep breaths. I want you to think about you at the age of 10, give or take a few years. What were the things that people either outright told you or told you because of their behavior? What were the messages that you received? And what is the message that you still hold on to that is getting in the way of the growth of your faith? It can be any number of things. So often in these moments we think about what was the thing where I got labeled something negative, but oftentimes there are moments where we are labeled something positive as well that is still getting in the way. Here are some of the examples that I've thought of. You are too out of shape to try the thing that you really want to try. You're a bad kid. You're so loud. You are so good. No one has to worry about you. You are not smart. You are lazy. You are unlovable. Thank you for doing that. You can open your eyes. So what is the thing? What is the message that you have landed on? What is the thing that keeps tripping you up? What is the thing that you would use to describe yourself? Maybe even before saying, I'm a person who is loved by Jesus. I want you to find a piece of paper. I want you to pull out your phone. I want you to grab a pen and write it on your hand. And I want you to write the word Jesus. And I want you to write the greater than symbol. And then I want you to put whatever that phrase was, whatever your origin story was, I want you to put it there next to this. Because here's the deal. God, God is never changing. He is the same. But he interacts with each of us in certain and specific ways. And so this is the thing that you get to remember about Jesus specifically for your life is that Jesus is greater than this origin story you have been lugging around with you that very well might not actually be the truth and may have built you a foundation of lies that you get to address today. Keep your eyes on Jesus, who is truly greater than everything.